Welcome everyone. It's May 7th, 2014 and this is Teachers Teaching Teachers and I am channeling Paul Allison tonight because <laughs> we're going to be co-hosting. This is um, show number 394 and we are going to be talking about Genius Hour as a MOOC. Um, and I'll have everybody introduce themselves, but just to frame this a little bit, because this is a continuation of a conversation that we had last week about MOOCs, and we're talking about um, encouraging intergenerational participation in MOOCs and getting more youth involved and what that might look like. Um, also to frame this, last week we talked about a wide variety of kinds of MOOCs, X MOOCs and C MOOCs and just all the issues around that, and I think um, this evening we'd like to really hone in on this as a C MOOC and a more connectivist MOOC and not really um, doing a lot of hands-on connection building and not so much trying to push out traditional content like an X MOOC. Welcome Matthew, it's nice to see you here. Um, hey so let's, uh, let's go around and just do um, brief introductions. And again, if anybody is in the chat room and wants to join us, jump on in. Um, Joe, you want to start? Uh, sure. Joe Fadaiso. Um, I'm a 12th grade English teacher over at Fremont High here in East Oakland, California. Thank you. Matthew? You're welcome. <laughs> Um, so I'm Mathieu Plourde. Um You can call me Matt. I I'm in the um, I'm an educational technologist and EDD student at the University of Delaware. And Matt's one of my OER friends, so it's nice to see him. Yeah, I don't yeah. I don't think you've been on TTT before, is that right? I've I've just been invited. I have no idea what you guys are doing here, but you know, <laughs> I, I was already on a hangout with Eric Qualman from Social Nomics uh, for another for another class that I'm involved with in, regarding social media. And um, so I just saw your invitation. I said, oh, whatever, what is that? Well, well, I guess I have some time, uh, some time to um, do that. So whatever. We'll see, what, we'll see how it goes. Well, welcome. And everyone, feel free to jump in and out as you need to. Paul? Right. And I'm, I thank you, Karen, for uh, doing this tonight because I need to jump out in about 10 minutes because um, I, I need to take care of my father who uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, and so I'm taking a bus late tonight all the way there. Anyway, um, so I, I'm a teacher at New Directions Secondary School um, in the Bronx, and um, I uh, have been working with Joanna and many others um, here. Oops. Monica might have the, okay. Hi, Monica. Um, anyway, um, I hear, and let me um, throw in right away that one of I have two things that are bubbling around in my head around MOOCs. One is, um, is there is there any way to use a MOOC, maybe not this idea, but maybe a similar one, um, about Genius Hour, but to use a MOOC to help us connect better um, than we do already on Youth Voices? Um, because we often miss each other. Like, Joe will do um, Hamlet this month, and Chris Sloan will do it, uh, you know, in, in October. So just to, as an organizing tool, and I know that's not the ultimate, but that's one of the um, things to think about, it seems to me. And the other is I've become more and more fascinated, and we can talk about this in two weeks again, but by all the banks that are around. The, um, I mean, on Youth Voices, we call it Youth Voices Missions, but if you start listing all the different places where kids could just go and find challenges and assignments and, and things. Um, there are a lot. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious about how we might use MOOCs to organize some of that experience. So that's where I am. Glad to be here for the short time. <laughs> and I think we are also planning a show to focus in really on banks and, and especially the new DS106 assignment bank on May 21st for people who are interested in joining back in on that. Cool. Good. And for anybody new watching, I should say this really is Paul's show. I'm just I'm just guesting tonight, which is really fun. Um, and Monica, Monica. <laughs> want to introduce yourself? I think you're muted. There yeah. you go. I'm Monica and I'm in Loveland, Colorado. And um, just focusing on listening. We're glad you're here. It's nice to see you. Raina? 
I'm Brina. I'm from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. I'm a teacher with uh, Palliser Beyond Borders. It's a new online school, and I'm a consultant. And I've been working on trying to figure out K-12 MOOCs, or I like to say MOOCification, because I don't think I would ever want um, to copy exactly what's going on in higher ed, because that's not what we do in K-12. We take pieces. Um, and So that's what I think I'm listening for and learning about today. But I do have to say one new thing that happened today, which was a surprise, uh, which goes with the intergenerational theme. Um, my son is in grade two and wanted to play um, Minecraft collaboratively with the world. And I was skeptical, and I have been skeptical. So through one of my classes that I've been working with, I met a wonderful teacher. And her son has come in and done some work in um, YouTube and Minecraft and creating videos. And he is going to be a Minecraft mentor for my son this summer. So that's going to be his kind of job babysitting my, my grade tour. So that's, I just thought I'd put that out there when we're talking about passion-based, genius hour, possible opportunities. It happened kind of naturally. But um, uh, those kind of ideas are what I'm curious about too. Things that happen because there's a need. Very awesome. I don't know if you saw last year on the K-12 online conference, Wes Fryer's son did a presentation on Minecraft. It was very cool. So definitely look that up. Um, so let's just jump in and talk about either some of the issues that, that Paul raised or just in general, does the idea of a genius hour type format, um, and, and if any of you have done genius hour, maybe you could talk a little more about it. But it basically the idea, it's like Google 20% time where um, it's been set up typically with students that have some allotted free time to work on a, a project that they feel passionately about. And one of the um, one of the questions I had raised in a blog post I wrote was that every time I hear about Genius Hour, I think, why don't we let teachers do this? And why isn't there a teacher thing? And Joy Kerr actually sent me a link to a teacher Genius Hour project that they did, which the link is on um, on the Titan Pad page. So I thought that was really cool. So reactions to how Genius Hour might work as a MOOC. And, and I think we're talking about a MOOC with a start and an end date, but that's another question that Paul and I have talked about, and particularly in that question of like youth voices, people working at different times. I think I found in other MOOCs that I do that if there's a start and end date, and it's relatively short, and I mean I tend towards six weeks. I think the um, I think the CL MOOC that we're going to be starting is maybe seven or eight weeks, um, but that that gives people sort of a bounded time frame to work in. I don't know. Karen, I, re I remember. Um, I remember how you didn't want CL MOOC to end. How did yeah, you? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> how did you adjust? Well, your... and so that's the, yeah, that's the issue of the intersection. I think between course and community with MOOCs, and I do think you know CL MOOC. We call it a collaboration instead of a course because it's really it's not sort of a direct instruction content being pushed out. Um, but I think there's advantages to having that time frame. But I also think if you can overlap with a community, and that's kind of what happened with CL MOOC. So there were a bunch of us. I mean, it's been almost a year since it's been over. People are still tweeting on the CL MOOC hashtag. But there isn't a formal, like, facilitated collaboration going on. And maybe there's, maybe you can have pieces of both of that together. Like Youth Voices is an ongoing community. But maybe there could be like a, like almost like a sprint where you say, you know, for the six weeks, a bunch of people are going to sort of, and that's kind of, you know, the great example, that's DS106 because they do, they have things that go on through the whole year like daily creates that people can do whenever they want or not. But then they also have like really focused however many week times where, you know, one week they do whatever, video, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, Where Matt the... saying in chat that oh. <laughs> structuring the informal learning, and I mean, you talk more about that. I think that's another 
tension that I always feel is how much do you structure and how much do you just have it be free form or how much do you how much is it a formal sort of thing where there's designated weekly activities or how much is it a just do anybody do anything they want whenever they want yeah um, well maybe I could jump in on this uh, I guess uh, my view on this is kind of you need a critical mass if you got a critical mass of people interested in a certain topic then basically you can do it whenever you want because you know that there's always going to be somebody who's going to be kind of tackling the same questions or, or wanting to have a conversation in a, in, the, in a time frame that makes sense for what you're asking in some way um, the problem really becomes when when you're sub massive basically um, and when you haven't found the people who are actually um, doing this um, it's kind of yeah so so it's, it's got to be convenient to people to want to learn something at so it's yeah that that's really the biggest challenge in my opinion and, and but you know when you look at the internet you look at personal learning networks that's how you know it, it works because there's that critical mass because you just connect on on topics and you connect with people that that you start building trust and building building relationships but um, if it when it's really around the course then you're just you're just chunking down to smaller pieces and you don't necessarily get that critical mass right I do think critical mass is really important and I think you know there's a lot of discussion about is how how important is massive in a MOOC and I think where it matters is if you're trying to group people around interest areas so you know in this scenario maybe we're doing projects that have overlap of topic interests you have to have enough people that you can form those small groups and there was a really good comment from Paige Woodard who unfortunately couldn't be here today but she wrote me a pretty long email about this and that's what she said when they've she does she's a um, high school student and they they do a they do a genius hour kind of course and she talked about you know when, when the magic happens is when there's a community people student oh, she's Paige she was on our show Remember? Oh, oh, Paige, Paige. Oh, yeah. I'm she's the one who interviewed Howard Reingold. Yeah, I yeah. get it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, I remember. Sorry. She's yeah. she's gonna write part of, in part of our open learning book too, or chapter. She's all over the place. Awesome. You know, um, getting at okay. So I have a couple of questions. One, would these be marked? And I'm gonna use the word marked because that's how you're gonna integrate formal learning. Doesn't mean I agree with that in any way, shape, or form. I'm just gonna say, is there some kind of credit? Or are you going to get some kind of mark for it? And then alternatively, um, I was writing up a list of possible MOOCs that people wanted to integrate with m my kids in the fall. And then I went, wait a second, I'm creating opportunities for genius hours here <laughs> just by listing, like there, some are environmental science, some are engineering, some are humanities. They're all over the place. And, th and then I thought, th that's a great opportunity, just creating a list not of MOOCs, but of two week short little project kind of more focused for K-12 like students but then that's and then I'm I also question you you're talking more about community Karen like building a community as opposed to a course when you talk about DS 106 and and so is that what we want more of in K-12 so anyway that's what I thought of when I heard you talk yeah there. yeah so on the marked question I, I mean my initial thought is to strongly say no that this is this is informal but then I think it's up to I think it's up to pods of people who participate so you know if it were one of the things is we're talking about this maybe during the summer but you know if Joe had a class and she said I want to do this as a part of my class and, and there's going to be some formal credit or grading or whatever it is I think that would be up to her and she could do that I, I think we wouldn't probably structure it that way. It, very much how Youth Voices is. I mean, some people participate in a formal in a formal way as a part of a class, and some don't. Is that fair, Paul? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All that's left up to the teacher organizing. Um, yeah. I'm 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 interested in. Joe, uh, did you want to jump in? Oh, sorry. Sorry. No, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, after Paul goes, go ahead, Paul. <laughs> one of, one of the things I'm interested in in, in all this is um, just in in reference to what Verena just said about other opportunities is students
I think we might have lost Paul. I'm going to wait for a second and see if he pops back in, and otherwise, Joe, go ahead. <laughs> One, two. No? Go ahead. He'll rejoin us. Okay. No, I was going to say, in listening to... I mean, I, I personally have never participated in a MOOC before, but when I'm listening to what people are asking about it, I'm immediately thinking of at the district level when the district has, so Oakland is a very large urban area, where at the district level there there's certain initiatives that impact, hi kitty, um, there's certain initiatives that impact um, all the schools. So at, at a high school level, so just 912, when you have a whole district like ours completely united under, not united, pushing a, a, a serious civic engagement initiative across all the grades. So this is, I'm just thinking high school. Um, I can see, I don't know what critical mass, in terms of community, I can totally see critical mass at the level of the, the Oakland community, um, uh, a percentage of the population participating in, because I can see a lot of seniors, say, doing um, something together that's about their senior project. I mean, they unite around that, um, and that ha that participation happening from nine to twelve, and in all different levels because all of the schools are at different levels of this type of engagement with technology, with just reaching out to the outside. So I don't know. I feel like that would, it's a very cool idea, especially if a district has, like, because ours is big. I mean, um, is pushing a certain like large agenda and then you're trying to reach the schools mm -hmm. in small ways. Um, that could be those subunits. Two-week units, absolutely. Um, ways for schools between each other to, to do something together, a, grade, a, ninth, a ninth grade class in one school with a 12th grade class in another, absolutely. What that all looks like, I have no idea. I, again, I haven't participated in one, so. Yeah. But the concept is cool. Well, join us at CL MOOC this summer. <laughs> it starts June 13th. Uh-oh. Um, I love that idea of participation across schools in a district. I don't know of anybody who's done that in K-12 with a MOOC. I, I know okay. of a couple cases where individual classrooms have participated, and my guess is probably, I was going to say probably without their school knowing, some of them, some of them knowing. But I would say that we've seen a lot more informal participation. I don't know. But I wonder if there can't just be both. Paul, oh, you're back with us. Oh, sorry. Paul's there. I'm back. Yeah. Did you hear my suggestion that students be creating some of the activities for each other? So that's that's we didn't one hear of that. The things but... I'm sorry. Okay. So one of the things I'm imagining about a K-12 MOOC is that we somehow organize kids to be leaders to create. Am I gone? Hello. Uh, maybe I'll go. <laughs> Karen, no, I can see you. Bubbly. You can't see me. Okay, so I'm gonna go. <laughs> Have fun. I'll get that point in later. We see can you. see you. It's just your your text is breaking up or your audio is breaking up. I'm gonna go. <laughs> see you. So I think what Paul was saying is that students would co-create the content and the activity. <laughs> oh yeah! Now we've lost our host. That's awesome. I'm back. Are you all there? Yes. Hi, Karen. Yep. Hey. Did everybody lose it or just me? And Paul? You and Paul. Yeah, just you. Well, we're back. So students creating <laughs> course activities or content. Talk about that, someone. I don't... Um, I had a student this year this year create a guru collection as part of his field research. That was interesting cuz he had in terms of creating something to teach others. Wow, it was massive. It was like 3 years worth of curriculum in one guru, in one collection. Cuz he had a lot. So I don't know. I don't, that's my only example of I mean I have other examples of students creating small things for other to teach others, but yeah, I don't I guess, yeah, I'd have to participate in one to understand it, really. 
That's very cool. You know, just when you were saying that, I was thinking, I just got back from a, a meeting about open educational resources, and there's a online school where the students are building the online curriculum. See, that's tight. Yeah, isn't it? I'm like, wow. wow. So I wonder what that would look like. I mean, the Genius Hour is is fairly unstructured anyway, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's the students are picking their topics and projects. I mean, really individually, or I guess they could do them in small groups. So I kind of think having them design this would work really well. well and I do uh, see that Paul's Paul's put in the ch chat in the other room. Um, Think about how to organize youth to take leadership role in a K-12 MOOC so that they are creating the assignments makes paths of learning for each other. When uh, Vicki Davis and Lee Graham and I did the Gamified, well, it wasn't really a MOOC, it was a project. We'll just call it open learning. I think the other part here is we don't have to define it as a MOOC. <laughs> we can just say it was networked learning or open learning in any capacity. Um, we, we found we did have to scaffold it a bit for the learners because they had absolutely no idea what we were getting at about PLNs or social networking or it was just too much all at once. So the way um, Vicky did it um, successfully was she it, we had a project which was to create a Wikipedia like version of games. So they evaluated games, but to get there they learned that they had to separate into guilds. And so everything was based on games based learning or gamification both both ways. And the students chose what guild they wanted to be on based on their own interests and their own skills. And if the students didn't want to participate because they weren't interested in anything, they went and did their own thing as well. So I still think that fits what we're talking about when we're talking about passion based learning or genius hour, although it was on the topic, yet we have little people. I said he was a <laughs> Hi there. This is the future of learning. He grows up with mommy on Google Hangouts. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Thanks, Max. There we go. But <laughs> we'll let someone else talk. What would uh, they? The grade nines then participated with grad students from uh, Alaska with Lee Grant's class, and that's again how they got that next level of specialization or expertise. And yeah, I'm gonna stop because he's pulling a thing out of my ear. So I'm anyone ask else? Questions yeah. Now. <laughs> You might have to ask others. <laughs> I think that's cool. So that was that sounds like it was more formal with two specific classes and it wasn't just open to anybody in the world. Is that right? Well, it was open to anyone in the world. <laughs> Did people do it? Did no, other people? Do it? Uh, yeah, actually, um, Melvina Karach, uh, Karach, I can't uh -huh, from Hawaii. 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 Yep. So she, her students participated, and it, and as I say, it was open, but people just weren't really ready, yeah, or wanted to participate. And I, th I think a part of it was because it was really long. I think that two week thing, that yeah. I don't know, that magic timing is something to be said for. For everyone in K-12, they're so busy. Yeah. So. Well, and I, I know one thing we've tried to do with um, CL MOOC is have it be really flexible so people could drop in for a couple weeks and then leave. Or, you know, there there is a start and end date that, that is a seven or eight weeks, but there it was also modular and will be this year, modular enough that people could participate on other time frames. So that might be something to think about. I would love to get some students who would be interested in doing this this summer to jump in and help us think through designing it. So open invitation to anybody who might know someone like that and I'll, I'll, I'll definitely extend the invitation to a few people. What about the timing of summer? I mean that obviously makes it harder for formal environments. Like, Do, do you all know students who might do this or what do you think might draw youth to participate in something like this, especially on the, in the summer? Students that, like, we have incoming seniors that would do it as like a 2.5 elective where they're understanding its connection to curriculum is going to happen in their senior year. Like, again, this would be like digital prep in a very cool way for their senior projects only because that's such a huge thing in Oakland it's like humongous mm -hmm. so it would be that and because it would only be like a 2.5 then 
yeah, I don't know. In terms of participation, what that would look like, they would be in it. They could be in it for the whole summer, but it would be at that chillax pace that California is so known for, right? Mm -hmm. So, I think that would be awesome. If you have a few who would like to do a future hangout with us, and uh, we invited uh, several youth and several other teachers who aren't here to this show, and we just it seemed to be a really busy night for people, but I think we want to continue this conversation and I totally agree with Paul that you know we need to have youth in the conversation of what this looks like and what would be appealing to them. Manga. Manga is appealing. Yeah, well, and that's totally, I mean it's it's basically choose your own adventure so they right pick on. any topic they want. They can do manga, it's fine. Cool. That's good. If you, did, I, if, yeah, if you did the Minecraft thing, we have the pile of people from the last move that you could put in. Yep. Um, cooking and food always seems to be, we always seem to have youth who are engaged in that, maybe gardening slash whatever. I know we've had some shows on TTT with youth on that. Any other, um, you know, I think just putting out there some topics might help engage people. Any other thoughts on initial topics? Have you talked to Angela Meyer at all? No, but that's an excellent idea. Um, here's a link in this chat. For the choose to matter, but yeah. for those of you who don't know, um, she's traveling around and giving talks, and the Genius Hour group gatherings are spending a whole day, perhaps, and brainstorming what they what matters to them. And I think she phrases it what makes them sad. But while I'm listening to you guys talk, um, maybe some of those kids that have already started things because they've been in the environment where they tried to free themselves up to think beyond the curriculum could pair with kids in California who are going to get credit and they did, the credit is going to be about facilitating tech or learning more about tech you know, so they could maybe facilitate the MOOC. I think the, the most helpful to me mindset about a MOOC is that I imagine it's so small that it, it doesn't matter if there's three that end up getting together every week, you know. Um, maybe they all get together once over the summer. But it's also so big that it's not that MOOC, you know, so it can continue. So maybe some of these kids from Angela's group are doing something that they need another summer to finish it off. Or maybe it's something that's going to last five years. Um, I love that, and I really like the idea of sort of intersecting with existing groups. I mean, that's something that people always bring up, like tapping into existing communities is something that National Writing Project, I think, has done really well, because then you have that sense of community, and I think tapping into some classrooms that are doing something like this, and I, I asked um, Joy Kerr, who, who is a big Genius Hour person, would her students be interested in doing this? And she actually did a poll, and it's, it's linked, there's a picture of it that's linked in the um, Titan pad. She did a poll with her students and said, would you be interested in doing a summer Genius Hour project? And they put their names yes and no, and I'd say it was about um, about a third yes, a third no, and a big clump in the middle that didn't, that didn't pick, and we, she wasn't. She just said uh, seventh graders. Who knows? But um, it, one of the things she said to me on Twitter was, when I said, "Do you think your students might be interested in participating in this?" She said, "My kids who are writing a novel right now would totally jump all over this because they're on the idea of wanting to wanting to do this and wanting to finish their novel." So it would be it would be a structure for them to do that in, which I thought that was really interesting. But I think reaching out to Angela is a great idea. Um, Christina and Jason have both joined us. If you guys would like to jump in and either introduce yourselves or add to the conversation or not, please do. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Thanks for the invite, Karen. I just got home, so I'm just sort of catching up with what you guys are talking about. So no problem. I'm really excited to be here, so thanks. Um, and yeah, the um, idea of, um, we did some experimentation with some youth um, leading these Make With Me's inspired from last summer, so I thought maybe I could, last summer's MOOC, they were, it wasn't in a MOOC, but it was inspired by 
what the teachers were doing last summer. So I thought maybe I could share some of that, but I'll I'll just wait until that if that seems useful. And then is it Jason who can introduce himself? I can't Hi, Jason. I, I'm the curriculum director of the Montana Digital Academy, and um, I don't nerd. OER guy. I don't. Karen probably probably better describe me than I could describe myself. But. <laughs> that guy. Nice to have you here. Thanks for the invite. So, Christina, I would love to hear more about what you were just talking about. And then I also just want to throw out a couple questions from the chat room that I think are pretty interesting. Um, Peggy was asking, how is this different from EdCamp? And I think there's definitely overlap. And Nate was saying, how is, how is Genius Hour as a MOOC different from just the plain old internet with everybody roaming around and organizing their own spaces around interest? And that's certainly something that Alan Levine, I know, talks about a lot. Like, the, the MOOC is an internet, or the internet is a MOOC. Why do we need these MOOCs? And, I mean, I have thoughts on that, but I'd like to hear from others about what, what distinguishes this and makes it have legs, I guess. I do think it's fun, funny, the internet... You know, a MOOC is the internet, internet is MOOC, I mean, and, um, but I guess, you know, if you think that way, a MOOC could be considered like a bounded opportunity to find some community spaces, like if you don't, if you don't have community spaces or you're looking for new community spaces or you're looking for new community spaces around new topics or new pathways that you're thinking about, then a MOOC might be like a bounded opportunity within this internet that's just like big ongoing because I mean the internet's vast both in terms of you know constant um, content that we can all add as well as time so the MOOC at least has some boundaries maybe around time maybe around some suggestions for topics or content so maybe it's like a bounded version you can participate in if you want to think of it that way <laughs> I think that does make sense, and I think a lot of people are more, and I would say myself, I'm much more likely to participate in something that is bounded and that has some structure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think of MOOCs that I've done that were really content-focused, that it was definitely content. I could have went out and found the resources and done it myself, but the fact that there was a specific thing that started on this date and I knew a group of people were going to be doing it with me and NaNoWriMo is like that for me, the novel writing thing. I mean yes, I could probably take the time to write a novel anytime I wanted but right. the fact that you know 100,000 people are doing this in November, I get very geared up to do it because of that. I, I think the other phenomenon too is is the step, what I call the step one problem, right? Like we, we can, we obviously have a, a vast amount of information available to us at our fingertip now, but if you are really want to explore something which you have no scaffolding to, where a formalized learning environment, even if it's on the less formal learning uh, learning spectrum, which is where I think most MOOCs sit, at least it's, it's someone organizing this so that you know how to proceed forward without that that, that initial scaffolding. Um, I think the you know in the same way that if I take an, a uh, a nuclear f uh, physics MOOC, I'm probably not going to, to get much out of it at first because there's an assumption of scaffolding there. If I took a basic physics MOOC, um, which organizes the topic of physics for me to be able to proceed down a pathway, I may deviate from that pathway at some point. I may get the confidence at some point to uh, head to another direction um, and, and maybe take control of, of what I really want to learn. But, you know, the, the vastness of the information available, I think, is intimidating to even the smartest among us. And so where I think a, a, a MOOC makes a lot of sense is that it takes some of the guesswork out of it. Um, you know, if I want to learn about something, the Wikipedia is really useful, so is Google, but those are tens of thousands, millions of links where a MOOC is going to at least give me a structure to work with so that I can feel some confidence from someone else that has some expertise in guiding my learning. I mentioned this last time too, Jason. You just reminded me about this again. It's that, like, there's scaffolded learning, and there's also um, the potential for sort of communities of practice, kind of um, ways of becoming part of a community. So I feel like there's content, but there's also like, if 
some of these opportunities are built in such a way that I think they introduce you into new communities of practice. And and so last week I mentioned communities of practice uh, like Love and Winger and really like that that going back to some of that research and some of that um, descriptions of how communities of practice work in these MOOCs too because I think that there is an opportunity both for scaffolded content but also for communities to expand and start to introduce new people. So I think that's another potential of them. That makes sense. Hi Lee, welcome. Hello, thank you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Um, I'm Lee Graham. I'm in Juneau, Alaska and I worked with Verena on the Gamified OOC last uh, semester and I've uh, taught a couple of MOOCs and so I'm mostly higher ed but I work on intergenerational projects. Open online class and so I hate, I, I know that this is controversial but I really dislike the word massive um, because I think that, uh, I think anything that's open by virtue of it being open is massive. Um, it has that potential so, so that's who I am, and I'm just here to, yes, <laughs> it can. <laughs> so for me, it was an open online class. Uh, for Verena, it was a community. And I'm well, glad so to be with you all. We're glad to have you here. Please jump in the conversation wherever you like. One of the conversations we're having in chat in the, in the other room is about the challenge with the fact that MOOC means so many things to so many different people. So somebody said they have a harder time with the MOOCs that are more assignment like, like do this by this date. And I mean I find that so many generalizations that people make about MOOCs, you can say well some MOOCs are like that but some MOOCs aren't. And it's almost, I feel like MOOC is almost getting to be like a book. Like you wouldn't say well all books are <laughs> it really even anything because there's so many and people have such broad experience that they relate to that. But I think MOOCs there are so many specific sort of preconceptions um, and I'll just say again you know definitely here we're talking about sort of I would say a less structured um, collaborative connectivist sort of environment for, for what that's worth. Um, I can Peggy, jump in to talk about, about um, the fuzziness of the MOOC concept um, because you know mm -hmm. you yeah so so I most of you probably have seen this you know being uh, used and reused uh, I created this item actually after a session with Verena and a lot of discussions in, at Educon two years ago yeah so because because um, we were talking with uh, John Becker and he was saying that every letter is negotiable in in MOOC and so basically that what that's what kind of draw the um, um, the whole idea of creating something like this to explain the word MOOC to people because people were just you know hey, you know what is massive really you know if you're you're like a, a you know if your classroom would usually have tw has 20 people then you know having a hundred is massive so massive means nothing um, the fact that it's open means nothing because it could be open content or it could be just open registration but everything is you know you basically as soon as you create your account we own your data um, you know is it you know online you know really it's you know what's online what's not is there really a course that is not online anymore you know is there any course that is not at least web enhanced so online is just a bogus word to start with and then the idea of a course, what is a course, you know? Um, you know, is there, you know, and some people say that it's a MOOC even though there's no start end date or, you know, there's no credits, there's no whatever, there's, and others are really like, well, it has to be like, a, you know, an expert, you know, again, sage on the stage type of deal, uh, sharing their, their knowledge. So, so that's kind of, um, that, that's really a frustration. That, that's been a frustration for me because people have been basically fighting over the taxonomy of the word MOOC and using the MOOC, the word MOOC as, as a bang, bang, bang wagon, bandwagon-ish uh, behavior just to show that they're in, that they understand it at, when they don't understand it at all and everybody has a different definition of what it is. Um, so I think that just having that distinction of the X MOOC versus the C MOOC helps but there's there's 
other layers of basically at some point we just have to stop using the word MOOC and start start talking about online courses or start up talking about online communities. Right. I totally agree. And thanks for sharing that, Matt. All of us in the channel in the chat room are saying how we've all used that graphic in different places. And it, I do think it's really useful to um to, to put that up there. I'm, I'm interested in moving the conversation to if we did something like this, what would be a way to structure collaboration in small groups, you know, perhaps around interest areas like manga or Minecraft? And Peggy is talking about in the chat the EdCamp home um, model and the idea of breakout groups in different hangouts. And Monica, I wonder if you want to talk about your. Um, I don't even know what to call it, but the hangouts where either people are talking to themselves or talking to each other every day, because that's something we've talked about in CL MOOC, and I know that's something we did in the Youth Voices summer camp um, last year as a way to sort of frame some of this. Well, I will throw out um, Dan Robles is launching a Curiosity. Um, which is in a lot of ways very similar to this app idea that we have and the, the talking to yourself every day so this is a vision now of what if we get to the point where we give everyone enough permission that the MOOC or whatever we call it is really just about being open and that um, we know there's going to be structure but it's going to be to the minuscule individual structure even every day maybe it changes but trusting that there'll be structure um, and we don't have to because right now all of us really kind of crave that I would imagine but we have this onus on us of what we're supposed to do um, and so we're being the best we can be about organizing it because we think it won't get done well it won't get done until we give all of us permission you know so I think until we all have enough permission to have enough time to study frogs or to study um, biochem or whatever we want to do that day um, without having to check off a list. Um, organize, helping organize these MOOCs is good because it can help um, provide the resources of connections, um, maybe in a more efficient way because we don't have that extra time of the permission. So, the vision is that you talk to yourself every day and those curiosities are what drive the MOOC. Now we're down to the very minuscule size of today I'm curious about this and then whatever, the app or whatever connects you to five other people locally, um, maybe a hundred thousand other people globally that are thinking the same thing that day. So it's to that extreme of the the limitation of what I think tech is allowing us to do today. I really love that. I'm I'm thinking about logistically because I think I that's how I think. I'm more <laughs> in the box and it's harder for me to break out. But if you if you have, you know, two thousand, three thousand people in a MOOC, how do you organize those small groups? I mean how do you how do you get I mean, I think you could throw topics out there like manga and groups will form, but I feel like there's always a lot of people who are just kind of hanging out and don't get engaged in that. Well, Does it make sense to talk about structuring it? Should we? Go ahead, Lee. I, Go ahead, I was Lee. I was just going to say, do, does it make sense to even try? I mean, to me, what we do is we throw out intriguing topics that we hope that people will engage with and self-form and then uh, Verena and I have talked a lot about the serendipity of the MOOC. Um, I mean there's so much that happens that is serendipitous I'm not sure that as a matter of fact the first MOOC that I did which was not anywhere near on the scale of, of what you, some of you have perhaps taught or, or participated in. Um, I tried to organize groups 
I tried to give them spaces to organize and say, this is where you go if you'd like to this and this, if this, and so many people per that. It was a disaster. Um, the, and then, but then we did this gamified this last time, and what we said was, you figure it out. You know, what is it? This is the topic. So what would you like to do conceptually? Where do you want to meet as a group? And, and what do you want to accomplish? Because there's got to be some goal for the group. This is the reason we're meeting. And it worked really well. And so whether that was because, again, of the serendipity of it, or it was because they self-selected where to go, and then we even had people, of course, who didn't complete. Maybe they got what they needed from the experience. I mean, it, maybe for them, their objectives were achieved. Maybe mine weren't, but theirs were. So I, I'm not sure that we can actually say these are your groups, this is how we split you out. I, I think we have to have uh, more trust in the learner and more trust in what in, in their understanding of what they need, just personally. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And I think as I think about where I've tried to structure it more or less, I think typically less is more. Although I, I do feel like I sometimes always hear from these people who just felt like they were lost and they didn't get connected. And, you know, I always want everybody to feel that connection because it's so amazing when it happens. But, but isn't that about self-directed learning too and, and being lost in the chaos and figuring out because we all had to start there. Like we all had to be there. I remember I had to start a Twitter account, have a blog created. I remember the list that Change11 gave me that first day and I had to send a tweet out and I, I thought that the world would read that tweet. You know, all those things going through your mind and I was upset when no one responded. All those first moment feelings, you have to experience that in order to figure it out for yourself. Why is that? Why can't we just let people experience for themselves? And it's going to take some people one minute and it's going to take some people a year and it, they may never get it. And I actually, I, I don't want to hijack the conversation. This is the last thing I'll say. I actually have a, an article in publication right now about four stages of evolution toward being able to participate in an open online community. And the first stage really is the people at the very first stage who never moved past that, and we called it resistance because they really were somewhat resistant. They were expecting their groups to reach out to them. I had one person actually even say, I was assigned to a group, which by the way, they weren't. Um, they, they selected a group. I was assigned to a group that never contacted me, so I never knew what to do. Now, this is the very first stage in which it's like I'm expecting somebody to push the information to me and to reach out to me. I don't think I have any responsibility in this. And so then there are other stages all the way up to realizing that your PLC is a group of people. It's they are people. They're not websites. They're not little 140 character messages on Twitter. They're individual human beings that you're connecting with, that you can connect with in many ways. And so I think much of it is just people coming to terms with the medium and coming to terms with what is my online identity, what is my digital footprint, how do I how do I manage it? How do I present myself online? How am I secure in this? And then being able to make authentic connections with people. Um, some people just aren't at that point yet. And some people get, I mean, some people get a lot of benefit out of a MOOC participating in that level. And, you know, I always say, every one of these I've finished, I've had somebody or often multiple people contact me that are people I never heard from, we didn't see them log in, nothing, and they tell me the story about how this experience changed their whole life. It changed their classroom, they're doing all this stuff, and I'm just, I mean, every time it happens, I'm like weeping. I'm like, and how is this happening and we're not knowing about it? But it's a good reminder to me that people participate in different ways and get different things. 
And and to me, they they didn't know how to go to Twitter. They didn't have the skill. It's again that digital divide that's just widening. Uh, if you don't have the skill, you may have the access, but you don't have the skill to go to Twitter and to see what's being said. And Monica, what happened was they decided which groups they were in, and then they went from Google Groups out into you know Google Hangouts or Facebook or Twitter or um, some of them did Wiki spaces so apparently this person's group just deserted them and they never knew where the group went they were completely clueless and never asked they just waited to be contacted I want to raise one more question as we're sort of winding down the hour and this was a question that um, Kevin Hodgson posed in a I think a comment to a blog post and it has to do with just wondering about the 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 dynamics of intergenerational learning spaces and how and I think particularly how teachers what's what's the comfort level and how do you make that work um, and he says um, that I know I project myself differently in different spaces where I know there are teachers as opposed to spaces I know where there are students using his teacher voice um, and just how how you know how do you foster an environment where it's really everyone everyone exploring and taking part and not teachers being teachers and students being students and I think you know National Writing Project and some of the work Paul's done with Youth Voices does a really nice job on that and I'm wondering if either Christina or Joe wants to comment on that or Monica or anyone else well I just wanted to um, I've had a couple experiences recently that are really that just were exciting to me so I don't know um, if, I, if it really fully answers the question but for for example um, recently we did a webinar on connected learning TV that was about um, openly networked learning and uh, Janelle Bentz, who's a teacher from Koppel, or she's at New Tech Koppel in Texas, um, had invited her students to join us. So we had two students, so uh, there were a few guests, um, Janelle was one of them, and then two of her students had like a shared earbud and were on one another camera, and then two other students were she had a shared earbud and they were on another camera. And they've been doing a lot of work on Twitter through the Do Now project, the KQED Do Now project. So they really had a lot to say about being openly networked. Like they were great guests and very comfortable. And so that was all lovely and exciting and we had a really good conversation. But then on Twitter, Janelle's whole class was watching the webinar. <laughs> And they all are used to tweeting, so they were all, I mean, the, the, the Twitter thing was going off the, you know, it's just, it was amazing. It was like off the charts. Like, so there were 28 other kids, <laughs> teens, I don't want to call them teens, um, tweeting at the same time during this webinar. It was the best learning experience I've had in a really long time. It was the best webinar I've been on. It was very, very exciting. And um, similarly, the next webinar, Minu's um, students, she brought three of her students, and they were all sitting in the same class together, and they just passed the, the computer like this among each other. Um, and they were both just brilliant webinars, brilliant conversations. Those students were talking about um, publications they had been working on, so they were really talking about following their interests through developing a shared publication. And um, yeah, so you know, I can, I, I've, so I feel lucky to have those experiences of, of, and I'm wondering, we should actually try to unpack what are the things that really help those be very successful interactions and um, yeah I mean there were no students teachers there everybody was totally together you know it was great I love that and I think that's a really nice um, summary of what we would be trying to accomplish with intergenerational participation in MOOCs and and my experience that that was along those lines was in the deeper learning MOOC where we had first of all we had students on every single panel but then we had two panels that were 
all youth and it was about what is deeper learning and mm -hmm. and what advice would you know what how should learning happen and and they were the best panels we did I mean they were they were better than all the sort of Harvard and MIT <laughs> professors we had they were just amazing and I think you know that is sort of what we're what we're aiming for somehow Cool. Yeah, we started so, talking about we should never do webinars without use. Yeah. <laughs> but I know Paul Allison's been thinking that too for a long time. You know, it's like yeah. Wow. Well, and so and that sort of leads to the how do you how do you market it and how do you get how do you make it appealing to youth? And I think Paul's point of getting youth involved in the upfront design of it is is right on. Mm -hmm. So again, I'll ask people, send me people you know who might be interested because we would love to do this. So we are winding down the hour. I want to go around and just give everybody an opportunity to make final comments on anything you didn't get to say that you want to or a closing thought on moving this forward this summer. Christine, do you want to start? Oh, um, well, I just talked. Maybe can someone else start? And then <laughs> Anybody else want to jump in? Sorry. I'll come back. Verena, do you mind? You're next to me. Oh, That's sorry. I, I, do, I don't know the order. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just really excited to be here. Yes, Jason, I'm so shy. You know that. You know me well. Um, but, Jason, I should get a big pat on the back because my district is going OER. So, uh, lots of conversations with you. Mm -hmm. um, my, my last thought on this is the possibilities are endless and it's just being open to it and not trying to structure it. I think that's what I was hearing today. Trying, trying to be organic. What does that look like? And, and can I do it? Can I really let it go? That's cool. I'm going to put a um, post-it note on my computer screen that says that. So, Jason, I'm calling on you next. Thanks, Karen. Um, <laughs> Well, I, you know, I, I'm reminded of something my boss always always talks about that uh, in my context, and I, and I run a, a virtual um, a statewide virtual school in the state of Montana, uh, the curriculum guide for that. And, you know, there's a difference between what adults want and there's a difference between what kids want. And um, there's a lot of things that adults are like, yeah, kids are really going to like that a lot. Um, um, and, a, you know, we offer it to kids, and kids are lukewarm about that. And so I think whenever you can... Um, you know, build uh, student feedback in from the ground up, I think you're always going to get a better product. And um, and sometimes they're going to tell you something that, that hurts um, or that is, is uh, you know, maybe overly honest about your idea. That's the great thing about, I think, about working with kids is that maybe they're they're not always able to, uh, you know, add padding around their comments, but they're certainly honest. And, um, you know, if you can use that honesty to your advantage, I think that's great, Jason. So I would, um, I'm would i tasking you with inviting some students to participate. And we do, we ver for people who are new to the show, we very frequently have students as a part of this panel. And unfortunately, tonight we invited a bunch and just nobody could do it for timing reasons. But um, yes, definitely. Who's next? Matt? I guess I can jump in. I'm I'm a shy individual too, so um, so basically um, I didn't know what to expect by coming here. I didn't know anything about Genius Hours. I think it's a great idea. Um, I don't know how operationalized it can become as a part of your schools. And I work in higher education, so I have nothing to do with these uh, the the challenges that you guys have in some way. Uh, MOOCs are kind of more of a, again, it's more of a branding type of deal for us. It's like everybody wants to do a MOOC, actually had a meeting with a uh, with our, our vice provost at the beginning of the week about, oh, we need to create a MOOC for the first year experience, whatever, because the common reader doesn't work. Well, st students are not going to read a book and they're not going to take a MOOC. You know, it's like it, if they're not self-directed, then it's just, it, it's just not going to work. Um, so, so that's the first step, basically. And and how can you address that? That's you know developing that self-directedness in the students. Um, and and I, I think that it, it goes deeper. It goes it goes basically deeper in Maslow's priority of needs. You know, if the kids doesn't have anything to eat for breakfast, 
then it, it won't care about being a self learner. You know, so it's kind of you, you have to work up those needs, and if you know, so social inequities also play in that 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 divide, that connectedness divide. Um, so that's kind of what I'm taking out of this uh, this conversation. But I, I, I'm I'm really happy to see that that there are thriving communities that are you know trying to tackle those problems in some way, shape, or form, and trying to change um, the way that 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 our kids are being you know um, just raised in the in the educational system. Nice, thank you. Lee, Chris, Monica? I'll, I'll be happy to talk now. Um, I'll just say that I think that the concept of the MOOC taps into some sort of intrinsic desire in many people. And that our, our children and, and our middle schoolers, our high schoolers, are very into social media. And so if we can harness that power to pull learning together in different ways for them, um, allowing ourselves to let go and trust them to the extent that we can and to somehow reward those things that they do well through academic credit, through badges, um, some sort of recognition. Um, I, I think that it is uh, an amazing thing for us to do. I know that my own daughter uh, learned how to code. She learned how to do all of these things before she was in ninth grade, all from PLNs, and this is before anybody was talking MOOC. And uh, so I, I think we should continue to, to push the envelope. I think we have to give up our old ideas of instructional design. I've been thinking about that a lot today. Um, I'm an instructional designer from way back and I've really had to throw everything I know out the window and try to, um, as Jason said, I think put my finger on the pulse of the population even when the population is very large to find out where we need to go next. It's very difficult to design an experience from start to finish. I find myself wanting to differentiate and somehow individualize even when the experience is huge. And so um, it, it's something that we're in, we're in our infancy and, um, and I would encourage us all to, to just uh, write about it, write about what we're doing. And, um, and also, I just want to thank you for inviting me to be here. This is spectacular, and I'm just I'm really happy to be with y'all this afternoon. So thank you. Thanks, Lee. Monica, final thought. Um, I think just adding that we are I think in a pickle right now. Um, until we get to the point which I think we are going to. Um, to where we could facilitate seven billion curiosities that are changing every day. Um, I think what we need to tell ourselves is that patience is really important. Patience in believing that there's never nothing going on um, so that we don't beat ourselves up. Because a lot of times, I would say in my experiences, 100% of the time, more than a badge or a grade, knowing that they have permission or that we have permission is more valuable, you know. So, creating a space that's an, an empty space is, is is really important, and being patient. That. Nice. Thank you so much, Chris. Final thought. Well, that was just a lovely set of final thoughts. So, thank you everybody for sharing that, and thank you, Karen, for organizing this gathering to think about this important topic of how do we bring, you know, all of us together intergenerationally. So, nice. Thank you all very much. And um, for those of you, I know we have several new people in the chat room. Um, for those of you who haven't watched TTT before, we're pretty much here every Wednesday at this time, and we cover a variety of topics. And I know we will be continuing this conversation um, about MOOCs and, and exploring new territory. Um, thank you all for being here, and thank you to our regular hosts, Paul Allison, Chris Sloan, and Monica Hardy. 
We love this hour we spend together every week. And we always thank Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo and the Ed Tech Talk channel on the World Bridges Network. Thank you all. Good night. And and keep write about this. I'm going to I have a couple things already I'm gonna blog. So keep writing and keep talking and we'll all we'll all connect more. Yeah. Good night. Thank you, Karen. Good night.